everyone, this is Edwin Overa from Edwin Overa Dance and Creative Services. And in this particular interview, uh, I'm doing, I'm interviewing Lynn, Lynn Needle, and uh, she is a former um, principal soloist with uh, Alan Nikolai and Murray Lewis, which is a world-renowned modern dance company um, based here in the United States. She's also the co-founder, no, I believe they're the founder and co-artistic director of um, Art of Motion, which is a nonprofit um, performing arts studio based in, in New Jersey. Can you tell me exactly what part? Is it Ridgewater, I believe? Or? No, it's, I know. Everything from, uh, begins with Ridge in New Jersey. Uh, it's Ridgewood. <laughs> Ridgewood, thank you. In, uh, which is in Bergen County. It's about we're, uh, 17 miles outside of Manhattan. So oh. we're like a suburb of New York. Perfect. And we met, I believe it was in 2009 or 2010. I was in New York with my brother. Um, and we had saw we, we noticed a class online that talked about how there was going to be some partnering um, and improvisation. And when we noticed that there was Kent Lindemere, who's another, uh, <laughs> he's also a, a dancer and a, a teacher at your, at your studio, former Palabolus dancer. Robert and I were really intrigued um, because of our background with both Momix and Palabolus. We wanted to see what was out there that was um, from, I guess, in a different generation for movement. Because a lot of times, you know. Um, there's so much more knowledge that's being lost as 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 everyone ages, or or um, uh, companies, you know, either phase out or you don't hear about them as much. So it was nice to go and you know take this class with you guys. It was I really enjoyed it. I love the fact how there was in the warm up, you know, you did your Pilates and floor floor warm, and then there was all that partnering that happened afterwards. And uh, a very um, well rounded class with technique and then also with um, physical technique like this. So. The way we start is, um, you know, I ask seven questions, and uh, which I, you know, prompt you a little bit earlier, so you know what they are. And what I'm curious about is, you know, how did you get started into dance? Uh, when when you were a, a, like say an infant or you know a kid, and then also teenager, and then in college years, you know, what? It, how did you get into it? When did you know you wanted to be a mover? Okay, wow, great, great question, great question. I started. Uh, Training, taking class as a child when I was four, and I was in a little uh, conservative basement suburban studio. Yeah. Where uh, often we're called once a weeker, and you would start once a week, and <laughs> five times a weeker. And uh, I had a wonderful teacher, and what was great was it was provincial and small, but very very special. And we uh, the emphasis was on performance and on process. It wasn't on result. There were no competitions. There were no trophies. Uh, there were beautiful costumes. Many of them were handmade. And my ballet teacher, Annette McKenna, was very, very petite. She did a lot of partner work. So I knew she always was the person for male partner, which I was very in the of. I thought it was magical to have a partner who could uh, create um, a duet work with. And so I began as a uh, free ballet student and then went on to study two or three times a week and rounded my training, my possible training out with that task. Mm. And I stuttered as a child. And I stuttered briefly, but enough that I was self conscious. Yeah. My, uh, I come from a medical family. My father's a retired cardiologist. And I was born on a uh, army base in oh. the Ohio. So we share that uh, kind the of The military memory. background, yeah. Um, and, uh, pardon me, he was on an Air Force station. He was a uh, cardiologist in the Air Force. And anyway, so in my family, we would say, oh, we would go to the ologist. So it was, all of a sudden, I had to go to the speech pathologist because I was a full and five year old stuttering. And my stuttering came from my mind thinking too fast. Yeah. Where I, I wasn't patient enough to wait to answer a question. So when I was in school, I was a hand waver. I was able to answer the question, what are the colors of the flag? And I'd be able to red, white, and blue. And I couldn't. So anyway, I went to the ologist, the speech pathologist, and he said, uh, what are the colors of the flag? And I spoke perfectly, red, white, and blue. What is the name? Name must be asked. What is the name? Name will live. And I said, drug. And I answered all of his questions perfectly. And I think it was my young uh, child's inner ego that didn't want to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. when I had an expert interviewing me, and I learned about breathing. And I taught myself as a child that if I would exhale, I would be better. So I would say, I would inhale quietly, and then I would say, red, white, blue. But mm -hmm. if I did it on an inhale, red, 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 So my dance teacher, of course, was aware of this well before I was, and she said, Lynn, you're always ahead of the rest of the class, and you need to listen more and 
clear the fog, and that's why you need to study jazz song. Because ah, jazz has to do the same rhythm and percussion and strong bass line, and you have to listen when you put your tap shoes on. Because you can't do nerve taps or shuffles or collapse not listening to the rhythm that's been mm -hmm. by the teacher. So I am so grateful to her for recommending jazz and tap as a cure for my stuttering and a cure for me to learn how to listen in a new way. Yeah. And ever since I studied jazz and tap, it's going to be in love with it. It's just so much fun to learn about my training. I did become a better listener and I became more musical and I stopped studying. So I'm very grateful for dance and now I have so many students that come to me with special needs across the spectrum, whether yeah. they're dyslexic or you know slight ADHD, or they have um, you know uh, problems with anxiety, uh, they have um, physical disabilities that we can help them with. Some of them are hard of hearing, some of them are Korean orphans, so they've had a palate with multiple surgeries. Yeah. Many of my adult students, of course, are cancer or cancer survivors have had aneurysm, um, scoliosis. I mean, the range of students that we teach at the studio is so vast. And so magical. Yeah. The students that have a disability are actually their ability to transcend that disability. So I regard disabilities as actually the opposite. It's their ability to lift everyone else up in the room. What they do. They inspire me. They inspire those around me. So having been a child with a, a, a disability that I overcame, I've always had a special place in my heart for understanding people that took a lot to the see. So. Anyway, age four, then I became a three time a weeker, and my uh, ballet teacher believed in Afro work at the end of ballet. So we always had a, a ceremony where the, the acrobatic mat would be rolled out. You, you know, practice your switches and your back bends and your cartwheels and, and your splits like three ways. And she allowed us to demonstrate by ourselves in solo because it was a little studio and there was a little room for three of us sitting all the time. Yeah. So moment in the spotlight, but that really helps to train your spine and your back and your, you know, which you off uh, quickly stretch. So I'm very grateful for that. We always found good balance. So uh, I had um, that training from age 4 to 17, and we used to go to conventions and master classes in New York City because I grew up very close to New York. So yeah. I would take the bus to New York when I was 13 by myself and take classes and, you know, kind of expand my horizons a little bit. And then I knew I wanted to dance in college, but I also wanted to be a doctor. So I went on the pre-med track. I wanted to go into pediatric medicine because I love children and I wanted to heal. I was very influenced by the power of my father to heal heart. Um, and as a cardiologist and an internist, he, I, he, was, he was never home because he was always getting some blood. So I, there were no beepers or cell phones you know, in my childhood, but my father was always home for dinner for half an hour in a meeting to go save someone's life. And I always knew that was just a higher good. You know, what could I possibly do in my life that could, you know, come close or equate what my father did to save lives and, and heal book and heart? Yeah. Um, not, not physically, but truly, physical, normal lives through his, his um, expertise in medicine. So I, as a young person, I wanted to go into pediatric medicine, but I also wanted to dance, and I thought, well, maybe I'll be a dancer. Maybe mm, I'll be yeah. a, and, and it was at that time that sports medicine was becoming more and more respected and more, and more um, interested to the general public. So I thought, well, I'll use it all, and I'll go into dance medicine. So off I go to a medical college, and I was a dance major who had an audition, and I had no idea what I wanted to dance Said the word, I was 17, I had no idea. And I went to the audition uh, with Martha Myers, and she was an expert in somatic and medicine at the time. And she asked us to improvise and go across the floor, running, jumping, leaping, and turning. And I panicked because I, nobody was showing me what to do. I needed something to demonstrate, mm -hmm. I needed an icon, um, uh, some kind of inspiration. So I made sure I went last so I could benefit from watching what everyone else did. And I, I absorbed, and I, you know, uh, was able to survive. You know, I was um, very uncomfortable with it, with the lack of structure. Yeah. And I sort of uh, opened my mind a little bit, and became more relaxed with it, and more interested, and more relaxed with my um, setting up. Uh, then I went on to go to the United Dance Festival at the University, where I spent a summer and studied abroad at uh, Trinity Lab on the Trinity Lab on the Trinity Lab in London. Mm -hmm. And that was life changing for two reasons. Uh, it was a zero tolerance atmosphere. Um, you literally would get a spank on your forehead if you had hair in your eyes, you get 
you're coming in with my bed and you know, the blue walls that you would have your standard studio drop. And, um, so there was a physicality to the training that was um, purely abusive, but it's fantastic. And yeah. the thing is, you can train people like that in America. And it was so highly disciplined. And coming from a New England local arts college where everything was pretty much kind of feel good and freedom and celebrate learning and a little more relaxed, at, I was at a point in my life in my maturity that I, I really celebrated what I wanted to do. So back I go to being a doctor dancer, and I had an internship opportunity in Colorado for three weeks to uh, intern in dance medicine. And I uh, was fortunate to be chosen, which meant they flew me out to Denver for three weeks, and I stayed with an alumni. So it was sort of an expense paid for each uh, immersion. And the reason why that was incredibly life changing is because it taught me what I didn't want to do because I did not want to go into dance therapy. And the mm. first week I was there I worked at Denver General Hospital with inmates. And for inmates that were shackled with the wrist of the ankles and they had a stroke in prison and they lost our line range of motion on the side of the body. So I, as a college intern, um, who they thought had had more medical experience my leg may have reflected because it was a paperwork snafu and the paperwork got confused and it felt like different. And so I just sort of kept saying yes to everything they told me. So, you know, could you work with this inmate and teach them how to walk again? Sure. Okay. Could you work with this day two, this gunshot wound, elderly patient gunshot wound? Could you give her a bath and OT and occupational therapy? Sure, I can do that. Well, of course, I fainted when I saw the wound. And, you know, so I had to put on the so I was all about yes until I realized it was beyond my comfort zone. Yeah. Off they shipped me to a um, clinic to work with terrorists and quadriplegia. And they were all men that were fired in a construction that had fallen off the couch of buildings, receiving cast and trees, and had spinal injuries. And this is way before Christopher Reed fell off the floor and had his spinal injury and was, you know, um, uh, 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 spinal cord injuries to really, um, a global issue. And I went in again as a college intern, I was 19 years old, and they said, can you work with me hanging RON neck down, waist down, with all these athletes and construction workers? And I said, sure. So I went into my jazz training of body part isolation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tried it in a five-step curl. And we had nerve balls, and we were kind of talking and playing, and I said, I'm really sick. And so I knew that wasn't a leotard job. It wasn't a job that you walked in and you were in your dance attire. You were, you know, you stayed for them because conservative and reverent and respectful and cautious and very mindful. Uh, and that was a riveting experience because a lot of the men, as all men, had still had their muscle tone because their injuries were so recent. Yeah. And for incredible emotional skills and psychological skills as well. But all the muscles were beginning to age really and, and our job as interns is to try to get them to exercise and keep those folks our own. Uh, third week, I worked with um, schizophrenic and worked with trying to have schizophrenic patients to reimburse into their um, public life. How to get on a bus, how to pay your fare, how to accept change, how to shake your hand, how to see and drive. And so, uh, needless to say, at the end of three weeks, it was an incredible immersion in a world that I had to exposed to. And thought that that essentially if I went on to medicine uh, to serve in a, in a healing environment, that it was going to be a okay, so it was be And I realized that it was something that maybe I wasn't mature enough for yet, yeah. and I wasn't prepared for, but I did want to do this myself. You know, I did want to perform. So that gave me really a kick in the pants to say, go back in the studio, train it, try to go to every audition, et cetera. So I went back, I graduated early, um, because I studies in London, I got out of medical college in about three, three and a half years. So that made me exit December, which took me to New York City before the holidays, and then I was able to do drop-in classes at various places, and I was a uh, very committed grant technique at the time, having been introduced to grant students at the dance festival. So I went, that was sort of my New York home. Yeah. You know? And they created great choice bodies. I mean, the, the contraction of the pelvis, the, the dancers were just phenomenal and so I was really successful with so I studied in Brown, and then I got a National Choreography Award through the ACBF, where mm -hmm. I met Murray Lewis, and I choreographed, I choreographed this very rebellious piece that was about my time in London, because I was in London during the height of the punk rock. Yeah, there. the punk rock, exactly. Yeah, so my, the piece was called Full Wave, and it was to the BBC News, and um, it was a, a mashup of music. Ed, Ed, Edgar Perez, which is a very, very avant-garde composer that was about 120 years ago. And, uh, um, 
Weren't you smoking that? Weren't your dancers smoking on the stage or something like that? Yeah, yeah. well, that was a big mistake. So, yeah, the opening today is the blackout with a cigarette on an inhale. So the opening lighting is the point of light of the cigarette. Yeah. People smoke in public dance. So as radical as that was to do that on stage, it was more common than people smoke you know, in public, public life. So, so at the, um, the histrionic, theatrical thinker, you know, I was always putting on a play in the day of the trial. You know, you know, you know, you know, and so I wanted to have this sort of back alley, very kind of Indian punk, um, uh, kind of nasty urban because there was so much anger in London at the time. It comes off as it was really about a lot of anger and about unemployment mm-hmm. and all struggling. And of course, in America, we sensationalized it. We made it about fashion and beauty and the punk rock haircuts that the kids would just like cut it with a razor blade and dye their hair purple became hundred dollar haircuts on Madison Avenue in New York. Isn't that something, huh? Yeah, and the, and the black leather jackets that the kids bought from the thrift shop, you know, or, or borrowed or in New York were became, you know, epic fashion statements that were. So I was really fascinated by how in, in our country we can take something and make it materialistic yeah. and make it make it not make it untouchable for the masses through um, just making it more than it needs to be. So I took my street experience in London and. Um, Stage something for three men and three women, and I wasn't happy with the politics in the college dance department, where often the dancers who get the roles and who are casted are the ones who have the most technique. And uh, again, being fascinated in my life is changed by my internship because I wake up every morning and be grateful that I can eat my cereal and brush my teeth, that I can I can move all of my average emotional. Yeah, life. a lot of things that people take for granted every day, and they're so gifted, and, and yet. Yeah. I forget. Walk, I can talk, I can feel grateful. And if I didn't have that experience when I was 19 in Colorado, I, I would have to be the So, left one. So, Nicole, Alan Nicolai, who is a mentor, always said that um, the body is our instrument and space is our candle. So, if you have responsibility as a dancer to take care of your body, whether it's through your diet or you know, your beverage or hydrating and training, you know, skills are in the ballet class that are, or, you know, being a, a good move. We always demand that we come with high spirit, which meant that you came ready to work, excited to work. You know, yeah. not just because for your own um, degree of uh, integrity, but because you could lift those around you into a higher place of excitement. So in life, I mean, I'm, we discussed this before that I'm a Sagittarian and possibly positive Sagittarian or negative Sagittarian. And sometimes it's my flaw because I'm in person and I expect everyone around me to be enthusiastic and have the sunshine and to want to And not everybody's um, circadian rhythm is like that. You yeah. know, sometimes it's fun and it's good to be dull for whatever reason. But anyway, uh, we are an amalgam of our ancestors and I always like to credit my teachers because I wouldn't be who I am having this wonderful moment with you of confession and storytelling if each one of my teachers you know, Annette, my, my Annette, uh, Miss Annette, my ballet teacher, um, always matched. She had a blue leotard and blue paste and blue ballet slippers and a blue, a blue bow in her hair and blue eyeshadow. And the next day it was all pink and the next day. And she was just a vision, you know, a vision. And I was talking to someone recently, again, a teacher at the university on the circuit, and how, you know, a lot of college and university dancers, again, not a negative thing, but modern dance should be less the time in which we live. Mm-hmm. And any dancers now in class reflect the time in which we live and they wear all their chest clothes and their old sweatpants and their old t-shirts and their old... And that's a great look. It's a street look. It's a hip look. It's very kind of spokeny and boho chic and fabulous. <laughs> but it's not old school that in Graham, when I took class with Martha Graham, I mean, you had to strip down and have a unitard on. And she, mm-hmm. You were hiding a contraction. She was going to be I mean, she used to threaten that you had to take class in the bikini for last fall, so she could see the contraction of the bare skin. And so not that pedestrian clothing is not being poor technique, and I'm all about celebrating the individual. And yeah, I and the style and everything. Less who they are. I love that. I love that. Um, you know, even in, in um, how dancers, uh, just how they come room to take class. You know, it's a reflection of this. This is the most personal and all those great stuff. Um, but in terms of the art of my dance training and my teachers, uh, festivals, which are fabulous for young dancers, introduce these 
like a menu of features. Yeah, exactly. Here at the ADF, I studied with Chuck Davis, who was a very famous African teacher. And we had African class outside on the lawn with live African drum owners. And, you know, I learned. I learned how to do You learned the, the rhythm. And I, I, I'll never forget it. I worshipped them. It was incredible. And it was magical to be site specifically about the yeah. You know, their feet, you know, too hot, you know. And then we're studying with Twyla Star, we're studying with, um, uh, you know, obviously Alan Nikolai, Martin Graham. I mean, I was so fortunate to study with uh, Daniel Negrin at Connecticut College, and just people that are uh, um, just epic, you know, just walking, just having their presence come into a studio or hearing their stories. Or Ruth Brower, who's our 96 year old lighting designer, who took class wow. with, uh, you know, Eric Hawkins and Louis Morris, who shared a birthday with him. And, uh, so I'm very uh, respectful of dance history, obviously modern dance history, but I've learned a lot from my course. I'm the director of the Big Volcano, who's a ballet uh, uh, expert and a walking ballet encyclopedia. And it informs what we do. I mean, to come and train every day and teach class every day, it's one thing to make your body physically and aesthetically and artistically go through that range of motion. Um, like this morning in ballet class, we're in a ballet class and you know, men and retirees and you know cancer survivors and you know I look up and down the bar and I just think, oh my gosh, these stories, the stories that are thrilling. They could write, you know, amazing, novels. amazing. Well, also productions too, because I know you did, you've done quite a few pieces where they were based either off cancer or some research or I mean, um, I just wrote the, the note down. In my I can't, I don't want to switch over because I don't want to lose the screen. But um, the one you did for the uh, TED, um, the TED Med. Uh, Shanti, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'd love to talk about that because that's a great fusion with my yoga in my life. Uh, so, after um, my end of my dance education, my formal dance education, you know, ended in college but really began because I was mentored by Murray. And then when I met Murray, when I won the um, uh, choreography, the National Choreography Dance Magazine Award, mm -hmm. uh, I won that award when I least expected it, which is what I want young people to understand it's almost everything in life that's epic happens in these success. Because if you're looking for it, it's not going to happen. It's when, oh, Edwin, I know. Oh. Oh. So I read a rehearsal next week and perform, you know, with Malabla. And uh, I was, I choreographed this piece that was extremely rebellious, rooted in punk rock, and the college wouldn't allow me to submit it to reflect the college. Mm. Because they were afraid it would reflect on Connecticut College in the state of the light. They were afraid my work was too radical. And I don't believe in censorship, especially at the college and the city level. Yeah. The people that said no to me, I went to someone else. And I knocked on the door and they said no and I knocked on another door and Just I knocked being on persistent. And I and I told someone said who's an acting teacher, you know, has people going sabbatical and then someone comes in with other shoes. And she said, Oh no, I I think we should submit this. Let's do it. And they submitted it in a regional festival in Boston Conservatory because uh, America was divided in five sections, um, east, west, north, south, and central. And we were representing this New England. And Murray Lewis was there with Colleen Toner from the Grand Tradition and Clay Kelly Afera from the Lamone Tradition. And they selected me to be a regional winner. And then it went on to the national release in the Kennedy Center. Yeah. Center yeah. The national. So what Murray later told me two years ago is that, and uh, this is very, very profound, is Murray admitted just at the end, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, closer to the end of his active teaching life, that he advocated for me on that adjudication panel, and that through only three of them, and that although all three of them agreed that my work was worthy of a national award. The other two adjudicators weren't as um, uh, effervescent about it, and and it reminded me when I'm in a position to advocate for my students to receive an award mm -hmm. or a scholarship that it could be your one voice that makes the difference. The panel, whether it's the NEA panel or your state panel, go uh, across the gray road from no to no to yes. You know that black and white never changes in between. Both. Did we have Edwin? Did we have Roberto? Did we have both? Did we have none? You know, you're always a feeling the cards of not knowing who's going to get the flush, right? Yeah. And when Murray told me that, I was so, I, I've always been in Edison, but I was so overwhelmed that he felt that strongly because we can vote and we can allocate funds, but we don't know who's going to come out. 
and he opened his mouth to say, this is why I think her work is deserving, I know it's radical, but here's why, and then he had the other two adjudicators say, you're right, we agree, and I am a pleasure. I was able to take that scholarship money to help offset my initial rent to move to New York and study, and then of course I met Murray. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm at the ground studio. He said, why are you there? So I'm in the Nick needs a dancer coming down. And I thought, in my naive sense, Edwin, I thought um, they wanted me to work back to Oh, no. So I always thought they needed somebody to be sweet, or to yeah. stuff. That's how we were going to be college. We always had to work you know, on a final update. So I went to class. I always take class up to the I always like to sit down and the class, you know, kind of place myself up stage. I'm not a front row, like, you know, yeah. Kind of and I took class, and Nick, you know, indicated and called me over after class and said, you know, what are you doing? You know, I'm at the ground studio. Wrong thing to say. It's like, you're not in facts and anything you're at any You know, I, I, but I didn't know any better. And he said, well, we're going to Portugal in two weeks. I'd like you to learn roles. And I still thought he meant money sound. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Or money sound or something technical. And he said, well, Timmy is going to come. And Timmy um, was from North Carolina School of the Arts. in Harlan, who you probably know. He moved with them. He's done last three months work with Melvin Lovelock, where he died. And Timmy and I went to work with the next day, and we were in Portugal to this program. Wow. Uh, so it was, it was, we learned um, two full ballets, two full, um, two acts. We used to do three acts back then. We wow. Did two it's, acts. it's almost unheard of now. All you hear now is just two, you know, just one act. Um, you know, exactly. In and out, in an hour. In and out. And you, know, you know, stretch with the Q&A and do, you know, audience engagement. Um, but we had so much state department touring back then, it was in the 1980s, so we had a lot of state department funded tours where we would meet the ambassadors and go to the home with the ambassadors and engage with some, uh, you know, important politicians in our in, in countries from, you know, Brazil to Asia to Africa, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if we only had a two act, we used to call the recession the third act. So that's what we struck, we had to, you know, dress up and... Dress up and interact and mingle. Uh, but then we do a two show day the next day. Yeah. The formula, very similar to Palabras, I'm sure, is we, you know, eight shows a week, TV appearances, interviews, master classes. And I'm very, very um, uh, super grateful to Nick who trusted me to teach on the road. That's my uh, little world training when my ballet teacher would have me demonstrate. She'd ask me to be the head of the bar to demonstrate, mm -hmm. which was, you know, responsibility. And so I always was fascinated by teaching and pedagogic theories of how you break something down to make it um, intelligent, to make it achievable and make it possible. And uh, we were on tour in France, and I speak French, not perfectly, but enough that I speak bilingual. And one of the uh, dancers who sit that was supposed to teach a master class, which rarely happens, you know, you perform on the road unless you're really done. Yeah. And um, Nick, because we always play percussion, we can accompany ourselves in this. Tradition. And Nick handed me a pair of drumsticks and he said, Lynn, can you do this? And I said, yes. And I grabbed it with the drumsticks and I caught from then on. Wow. The moment of me, where he needed somebody that could speak the language, he knew that I taught. And you were available. He, I was available, and but I said yes because I'm a vegetarian. So, <laughs> yeah. You naturally say, yes, and let's do it. Why not? We're in Greece in the amphitheater. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you would do those European tours, and the amphitheaters were incredible. Mm -hmm. There were thousands um, and the mosquitoes are, you know, in there. <laughs> but he's lighting Numenon, which is one of his seminal pieces where we're in the back. And I would say that was two of the boys, because I'm tall. So, you know, Nick always wanted three people the same size. So and I was tall, though, so I was the same size. And several of them come. So we're in our Numenon bag, and he goes, just not afraid of height. So I'm the hand waver. I'm like, I'm not afraid of height. And he goes, okay, be careful with this one. Yeah. He goes, I need you to climb the mountain up to that peak, and we'll bring your Numenon bench, which is the top piece. And I want you to perform Numenon. So when the lights go up, we have two dancers on stage, and then that's the prize that, of course, we lit impeccably. So Nick was the master, an early master of site specific work. Yeah. Then not only did he light his work brilliantly, both indoors and out, but so being able to assess. You know, it's like the way a doctor assesses a patient and then diagnoses the problem. Mm -hmm. He would assess the site, the theater, and the possibility 
So even when he went in at the premium, and I know Palab was just doing their um, shows down with the main rag open. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. going to one Showing it. Exactly. And, and, you know, so it's exciting for the audience to see that. And when I was at the George Houston last year, I was mentioning the European tour, the French tour, and she handed me her cell phone. She was can you take my, my picture? And she wanted her picture with the Palabla expansion in the background warming up. Yeah. She did it. I was compliant because I'm, you know, a New Yorker. <laughs> and then I got thanked by the usher because the usher at the joy said, you know, I have to take pictures of the dancers. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but it was crucial. It's where everybody thought because everybody wants to talk to that, right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I'm so indebted for what I learned to admit about, about um, being a virgin and seeing things for the first time. You know, seeing a theater, it's like a, it's, it is like a romantic relationship. You see it for the first time, and you think, how do I get to know you? Am I aggressive? Do I open the main rack? Do I close it? Do I have time to run backstage and see if there's a spotlight? And, you know, what's the lighting plan? And you have to have this cultivated relationship instantly with the theater to be able to maximize what, what it can offer you and your dancers. And now when we do run out, and there's no, you know, there's three to six hour tests. Ridiculous. You need a full day to test. You need two days sometimes to light, you know, but everything is like the theater. They didn't do yeah, you didn't get out. And, and, it, and you, lose, you lose a lot of the, um, the aesthetics of it then, you know, and, and even parts of the, the essence because, because everything is so um, shortcut. It's a shortcut version of stuff. And those compromises make me sick. Yeah. Like, like it makes me sick because I feel like our, our obligation as artists is to bring the highest level of our work that we can, and when we're forced to make these fast decisions and you're compromising, you don't want to compromise your artistry and your integrity, yet you have to get to the finish line. So instead of being frustrated, which I have been for years by it, I've learned how to tackle it, you know, how to kind of wrestle with the dragon, and I've created coping mechanisms um, emotionally and artistically for myself whether it's a yoga breath or going in and saying, I, I'm expecting that this is going to be, you know, high high pressure. Or recently we worked at a college, a wonderful college, and we were promised student technicians who were fantastic. And then uh, someone got sick and they replaced them with a child with autism. Mm-hmm. So we had an autistic youth in the booth helping to run the light board. So we had to have such patience and such understanding love to be able to work with these students that we, 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 we did it and it was a big challenge and it was a wonderful opportunity because he was exposed to this magical experience of running the whiteboard. Yeah. We know that we probably would have gotten, you know, had an extra man on base, so to speak, to be able to come and just coach the students one on one. Yeah. Having a student work in a high, you know, high, high pressure environment. Um, so Again, Nate would always teach us how to sort of, you know, it's like in football, you just catch the pass and run the ball and just try to, you know, catch a, um, what do they call that when a light throws through a curveball? You know how light throws through a curveball? Yeah, exactly. And like if it's a curveball, you got to catch it and do something with it and go over the ball or you're going to drop it. Where does that leave you? Nowhere. You know, you're an out. And then other or you miss the out. opportunity because you, you didn't know how to adapt to the situation. Exactly. So, you know, if you have a solo that's lit from an overhead spot with front of house or no front of house, and then you have a shadow on your face, it's like I tore with us. I have these little mini sneakers I tore with. And I go, can you plug this in? Focus it this way? You know, and then if they say no, and we try to say, you know, okay, that seems okay with great. Instead of, you know, like, what am I going to say? I need to have a better poker face. You know, instead of. A better poker face? Poker. Um, here's a question. When you were with, with um, Alan Nikolai and Mary Lewis, how long were you with that company for before you, you know, either um, transition out and you know, decided to pursue your own individual career? So uh, after college, I got into the next company in 1981 when I went to the dance club. And then the tour uh, to Portugal was 82. I was with Nick. We did six out of seven continents in seven years. Wow. So I was with them through the end of 87. Uh, and but I stayed. I never left. So even though I left the company because I fell in love and met my husband, and he's standing away from me anymore. And my partner had left, Raul Trujillo. Mm-hmm. And uh, Raul is a Native American Indian. He's a very accomplished actor now, and he does a lot of work with um, Harrison Ford and um, 
who's the guy, uh, James Bond, uh, Daniel... Oh, Daniel Craig, I think his name is? Yeah, yeah, Daniel Craig. Okay. Uh, you can Google him. He's still incredible. But anyway, Raul was incredibly spiritual because he had come into his um, upbringing and his background. Mm -hmm. And we were very attached and very close. And when he left, he was also tall and strong and he had a good um, chemistry and partner. So when I decided to leave um, the company, partly it was because my partner had left and partly because Nick was um, coming quite ill. I mm wasn't -hmm. going to the company as much. And um, I met my husband, Mark, who was one of the away from his adoption. So Mary Nick said, well, stay and just direct the school. So I thought, great. Right, I can still work with you and still, you know, do it all and still teach and, you know, interact with the company that actually we left out before. So I was able to continue directing the school for another 10 years. And up until uh, uh, about Nick died in 1993, and I stayed on to about 97 when Murray had to make a difficult decision to close this school mm -hmm. because staying, obviously, you know, this is a really difficult financial period in time and dance culture. And uh, then I stayed on to this super active alumni, and we actually just performed a season of next year. In June? Um, it was just past June, right? The 16th or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, June 13th, I think. Mm -hmm. We did two nights at Henry Street, a uh, full evening of all of them. With uh, ten of us, five men and five women, which is the formula that were from stage 42 to 60. Wow! It was so fun, and um, five of us were from the same vintage. Penny Carling, Alberto Del Paz, James Murphy, Kay Anderson, and I were all from the same vintage. And then a lot of the other dancers were from the 90s, you know, the younger. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did some of the uh, signature work, you know, kept on involving the elastic and went to zoom in on with the holes in the bag and. Uh, girls Trio, which is a hula hoop skirt dress. It's just like a sort of, it's called, you can call it chest skater. It looks like you were chest pieces kind of floating. Mm -hmm. So that was very historic and fascinating to have a, uh, like, the collector of dance, you know, to have sort of a nostalgic dance with the alumni event. And I know Philopolis did this. Um, I know, sadly, when Jonathan Wilkin died, it was fabulous that long. Yes, exactly. And they invited some of my men to come back and perform. Uh, and I wish companies would do this more often. I think it's I think there's an audience for it to bring. Whether if it's at Milwaukee, whether if it's at colleges bringing alumni back to perform, it's something excuse me, it accomplishes what you're doing is uh, a mentorship program mm -hmm. that students are saying, Oh my goodness, I could be Edwin or I could be a father and a dancer. You know, or I could be an Marty and a dancer. It is Yeah, you can. You can have a baby, you can have your professional career, your business career, and you can be a, a mother at the same time. It's just, as, as we both know, um, uh, time, is, time management is, is so important. One, as we age. Two, as we get more responsibilities. Three, as we're um, you know, wanting to venture off into other avenues artistically. It's how do, you, how do you manage your time? and How do you take advantage of that time when you're there? You know, total investment from the very beginning of that two-hour chunk or that one-hour chunk. Or, or this. And in millennium, the year 2000, I wanted to have kind of a blue moon moment. You know, to be the one kind of blue moon. And I, I literally got turned on to yoga, which is embarrassing to admit, but um, through a coupon. Through and a coupon? Yes. Yeah, I got a coupon in the mail. So I said, ah, you know, I thought, oh, okay. So I went to the studio, and it was uh, Iyengar, very pure Iyengar. Yes, studio. I love Iyengar. Uh, uh, Kim Peralta was her name. And I took my first Iyengar class, and I think I was so enamored and hooked because it reminded me of the discipline of Russian ballet. Mm -hmm. You know, a proper alignment. Form alignment. And right. that you, if, you, if you train the body in a proper manner, it will serve you well. Mm -hmm. And she was... I mean, she was so I am and so rigid, and I I sort of a love hate relationship. You know, I I I was so happy I got my foot in the door, and I had had to ask about injuries. Um, I was a wild child with both feet in my body. Oh my god! With play riding and skiing and ice skating and you know falling off my bicycle riding a two wheeler, and my left arm is super hyperextended. It's very distorted because I broke it so many times. And every time they put me back together again, and I would break another bone, my mother would say, Does it feel like the last time? And I, 
come back, we'd go to the ER and I'd save all my cats. I would have all my cats under my bed after a pair of cats were all the kids would sign it and I would save them all and then she gave me sort of that one day because they would start to smell. But I also survived a really epic um, head on car accident when I was 17 mm. that I really shouldn't have walked away from. And uh, it, was a, it was prom weekend, and I was picking up my dress with my best girlfriend, and both of us had our parents away for the first time, like out of state. So there was a lot of trust, and um, we were just driving to uh, pick up dresses, and there was someone um, high smoking, and he dropped um, the cigarette joint butt, and he bent over to pick it up, and he was smiling. So it was complete head, head on collusion. Oh, my God. It saved our lives, but it was so perfect because the car associated with bigger and it was an accordion pole. So the impact was so perfect that that's what saved our lives. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, I went to the prom and profile. That's the right side of my face. Uh, I did nothing with that. Good sense of humor. Okay, so yes. So. Um, and, but that was like changing because my girlfriend that um, survived the accident with me uh, died 10 years later from colon cancer. And she was my soulmate in life, so to lose her soulmate is devastating. Um, and I, she's irreplaceable as a friend. You know, it's yeah. like you, you, you mourn and you, you know, I still wake up every day thinking, why was it me? How, you know, how did, how did we lose Carrie? And how, as you know, women, well, women, I mean, it's so rare to almost be a male um, uh, uh, illness disease. And she was one of those, like, one or two percent in medical journals that say, you know. But she suffered from eating disorders, and she probably wanted the stomach uh, a bit. Um, so that's a, a great story for young people, not just for the body. Yeah. Um, so that inspired me. And um, I sort of have a superstition about um, dancing for lost loved ones, that every day when I PA or stretch or, you know, practice yoga, I, I do it for people that I've lost. So it really makes me feel like I'm, 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 I'm paying homage mm -hmm. to all people that have, I've respected so much that have helped me who I am as an individual. Um, so I, I grew up with a very, very superstitious German great grandmother. It's rare that you have a great grandmother in your life. <laughs> and she would, you know, every time I moved, there was a superstition. You know, you had a spread on your clothes. A letter was coming, you dropped a spoon, company was coming, you know, a black cat walked by, you're going to have bad luck all day, and so I'm very superstitious. So I try to, I create my own little superstition to keep myself motivated. I think it's this is interesting you say that because when I grew up, when I grew up, um, both my mom and my dad had a lot of superstition as well as like mysticism. I know your time is coming short because you have to. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, three. I, I guess if we're, if, uh, do you have to leave now, Lynn? Okay. But your schedule allows it. We could pick up tomorrow. Here's um, my schedule is going to get busy. But here's what here's one thing. If there's one thing that you could leave the young artists with, uh, let's say one comment on a say a professional level. What would you tell young artists to, to be conscious of or to be mindful of or whatever? To always be yourself mm -hmm. and be true to your heart. And don't let negative people get in your way. Thank you. Thank you. And um, last thing is, can you tell people where they can find your information, like online, like your website? and? We have two websites. Uh, one is w.artofmotion.org. Mm -hmm. We're a nonprofit. That's the studio website. It's all one word, artofmotion.org. And the second one is the company website, and that's w.aomdc, mm -hmm. or artofmotion.org. And one clicks to the other, but they're, they're both great resources and information. Perfect. Thank you. And I'll put in uh, other information in uh, the bio and all the stuff in the very background so people know um, of your expertise and what you're doing, especially for those who are watching this video. If they're in the, in the New England area, you know, they should stop by your studio because it is a treasure. It's a, it's a beautiful space. Yes. I've been there. And you should come back. I will. We have to set something up maybe for the fall. Your brother's right in Brooklyn. Come visit him and come. I know. Yeah, it's great in the fall. Thank you. And thanks for your time, Lynn. I know. Thank you. With that being said, thank you, thank you, Lynn. And um, I look forward to posting this up soon, okay? All right, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.